So welcome everyone. Did you know that cross-site scripting is the most prevalent security issue in general? Um, and that is why today I want to share my approach to finding and fixing DOM-based cross-site scripting. Specifically, we will focus on DOM-based cross-site scripting, which is a specific kind of XSS which has been on the rise in the last years, specifically with a trend to electron applications and single application, single page applications being on the rise. Um, my name is Frederick Braun, also known as Freddy or Freddy B on Twitter. I have been working on web security for over 15 years, uh, first as a teacher, uh, now as a security engineer uh, for Firefox, and I'm also co-author of web standards, for example, sub-resource integrity. So looking into cross-site scripting, um, I will go over the following um, agenda items today. We will learn about static analysis and the pros and cons for using it. We will also find out how to use this for finding potential access as vulnerabilities and how to do so more easily and automatically. And by the end of our time together, you will know how to use this for your code base, whether it's JavaScript or TypeScript, and how to do so gradually, so you don't have to do all the work in one single big shot. If you have any questions throughout the next 30 minutes, please um, move them over to the Vito platform, and I'll be happy to look into them after this presentation. I will stay online um, for a while on the platform after this presentation, and you will always be able to reach me through Twitter or email. I'm really keen to get some feedback on this material that I'm sharing today. At the very end, I will also share my slides uh, with you through the platform so we can go through things in detail. So let's briefly look at what cross-site scripting means. Um, I suppose many of you have some experience with cross-site scripting, and you might know that cross-site scripting is the scenario when user-controlled, or in this case, attacker-controlled information, is used as HTML markup and JavaScript in the scope of your application. So XSS is the general case that whenever an attacker is able to provide HTML and JavaScript and is able to insert it into your web page and then is executing code within your web page. Today, we will focus just on DOM-based cross-site scripting, which has been the most um, rising case of cross-site scripting. And DOM-based cross-site scripting basically means when the vulnerability is implemented and the root cause of cross-site scripting is in the front end or in the JavaScript parts of the application. To get a better understanding of DOM-based cross-site scripting, let's quickly look at this tiny snippet of JavaScript code. We're going to be really slow here. These are two lines. The first one is assigning a variable, and the second one is moving the content of the variable into main.innerHTML. That means whatever main is, the HTML will be modified according to the string. And let us assume for the sake of this tiny experiment that image URI is attacker controlled. And let's think about how someone would be able to cause cross-site scripting here. We will also do some very, very lightweight information flow analysis, which is why I'm introducing two terms here, the source and the sync of some information flowing. All right, so the source is the variable image URL, and the sync is main.innerHTML, which is where the information supplied by the user or the attacker is actually inserted into the DOM. Okay, and you may or may not have thought about some way to attack this specific line of code. Here's my solution, but obviously various solutions would work. In this case, we are ending the source attribute to make sure that the image doesn't load properly. We could also just put some garbage in there. Then we end the attribute. We continue with a new attribute with a name on error that will cause the JavaScript supplied in the attribute value to be executed when the Im image load errors, which it would because we control the source. And the result is naturally, in this case, an alert box. But as you all know, this is a JavaScript conference. There is much, much more harm an attacker can do when they are able to execute JavaScript in your application, right? This isn't just about alert box. This is about taking control of your whole application. 
So this is really why we need to why we need to work on cross-site scripting and why we want to solve this. In the best case, solve this completely. Now, before, before we talk about the completion part, let's try how we do some sort of analysis in an automatic way. As I mentioned, there are sources and sinks of information flow, and we would have to look at more or less both of them if we wanted to find DOM-based cross-site scripting. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna spoil a part of the solution right here, we will not go and look through all of the sources. They are too numerous and hard to identify by just reading the source code, which is what we're gonna do automatically later on. Sources can be URL parameters, forms, cookies, and really every other content that might be user controlled. And if we had identified all of those sources, we'd still have to trace the information through the whole code of the application, which can be really tricky. And it might require us to have a model of the browser, the DOM or whatnot, or even run a browser. That's not what we're gonna do today. Let's try and see if we can only inspect the sinks of DOM-based cross-site scripting. Specifically, here are some examples for DOM-based cross-site scripting sinks that we will look at within this presentation. First of all, we wanna look at assignments outer HTML and inner HTML, and we will do so only when the operator for the assignment is an equal sign or a plus equal sign, because any other assignment wouldn't be able to cause cross-head scripting. Secondly, we will take a look at specific function calls. We will look at, for example, insert adjacent HTML, document write, document write line even though I hope for various reasons that people aren't using document write and document write line anymore, you wanna be exhaustive. Um, and then let's see if we can restrict the usage of those specific things with a linter. So let's go to the linting part of our presentation. How do we do this automatically? How do we follow the approach of finding DOM-based cross-head scripting? And before we do so, I wanna share that there are some caveats to my approach, okay? So there are various approach to code analysis in general. And the very, very high level bird's eye view of the potential approaches is static analysis and dynamic analysis. And the rough idea is that static analysis will always read through the source code and really only know what is written in the source files and dynamic analysis will execute the source code. So it doesn't know all of the code because there's never all code executed. There might be some if and else's that the code won't, won't run into, um, but it will actually execute. So it will know more. Specifically, static analysis will be able to um, yeah, read the source code, look at all of the variables, but not at their content and static analysis has the chance to be really fast because it's really just you know, reading text files. There is no visibility into the variable's contents, but that also means there might be false positives, right? A static analysis approach might complain about something that isn't actually a vulnerability. And naturally, because it is reading source code, it might be fooled by minification and obfuscation. So if you integrate this into your build system, do it before the minification bits. And dynamics, uh, dynamic analysis is naturally a bit less prone to false positives because it does see the value of the variables. But it is limited to the code that is being executed and instrumented. And by instrumented, I mean monitored. And there is a risk for dynamic analysis to be a bit slower because it has to be as fast or as slow as your application really is, plus a bit of a monitoring overhead. And uh, as a reminder, you are here in the static analysis presentation, okay? So we will not focus on dynamic analysis. And I really want to acknowledge that there are some really cool dynamic analysis approaches that you might want to look at, but not within this presentation. And now you might wonder, how do we do static analysis? I've never heard of a static analysis tool in JavaScript. Is it that easy? How much does it cost? How hard is it to integrate? Well, let me tell you about ESLint. You may already be using a linter in your JavaScript application. It might not be ESLint, 
but we will, for the sake of this example here, we will use ESLint. And that is basically all you need for a static analysis because that is exactly what a linter is doing. It's reading the source code and it's giving you tips on what to do and what not to do. So let's see, what would we do if we wanted to build the minimum viable static analysis check for cross-head scripting? Specifically, let's see how a linter would see those two source lines of JavaScript. We will look at them individually and what the linter is doing with those. As you may or may not know, a linter is basically an implementation of a JavaScript parser. So it knows the JavaScript language and it builds a so-called abstract syntax tree. In short, an AST. And for this particular source line, the AST looks like this tree. And let's think about the structure for a moment. At the, I will slowly walk you down through this. At the very top, the whole line is an assignment expression, right? We are assigning something. And I will walk you through the yellow boxes first. The assignment expression has an operator in this, call, in this case equals. And then there is a left-hand side and a right-hand side, as there is with every assignment expression. The left-hand side in itself is another expression. You know, this is a tree after all. Um, and specifically, it will look at foo.innerHTML, where foo is the object and innerHTML is a property of that object. So let's think for a moment. What's in the purple box? What's the right-hand side? of our assignment expression. It will say identifier evil because that's all the syntax tree knows. That's all the linter will know. There is just another variable and it has a name. Let's look at the syntax tree. Let's remember the evil bit and the variable bit for a moment and look at this tree for another case for a case that I would consider safe in the case of cross-head scripting, right? Nobody can, can execute code when they are just clearing out, um, clearing out the DOM. And specifically, this is a hard-coded empty string, right? In the source code, it says equals empty string. This is safe. Um, and in this case, the right-hand side of the syntax tree, as you can see here in green, says literal. So it is really to be taken literally. There is no dynamic or variable value to take into consideration. We can say this is a safe syntax tree in the case of looking for cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. So let's quickly go back to the bad case and continue to think about the information we can obtain and specifically about the information we cannot obtain. And what do we know about evil? So as I've said before, and as I need to tell you again, the data and the contents behind all of the identifiers in the source code is completely or almost completely unknown to static analysis, at least given really just this tree. All we know is that there are three variables foo in HTML and evil, and that is not very useful. We don't even know the type of those identifiers because as you know, JavaScript is dynamically typed and it isn't hard coded in your source code. So how would you know? Basically, we know almost exactly nothing. Specifically for evil, it might not be evil at all. It might just be a variable with a name, I don't know, template, and then you'd have to guess, is this safe? Is this not safe? It might even be a constant declared somewhere else in the code. So maybe that's something Elinta would have to look at. Is this variable declared as const somewhere? And then it might be perfectly safe because it has gone through code review. So let's keep this in mind as an important caveat for um, static analysis and linting for cross-head scripting in general. And now let's find out what we can do to avoid false positives. 
and maybe to avoid the linter, to scream wolf and say, oh no, this is evil all of the time when it might not be evil. So what we've done in our case is we've uh, made a configuration setting that allows to configure a sanitizer. A sanitizer in this case is a function that whatever HTML you throw into the function, the return value will always be considered perfectly safe for your application. So maybe if the right hand side of the assignment expression would be sanitize evil, then we can always say no need to alert, no need to complain. The developer is doing the very right thing here. They are not implementing a vulnerability, but they're doing the safe choice. Secondly, for the sake of our analysis, we do want to allow hard-coded strings, right? We're assuming normal, I want to say, average code review practice where hard-coded strings that contain something bad will be caught by human code review and don't have to be caught by static analysis. Secondly, um, we will pick our battles, right? We will not complain about code in a tests folder because that's most likely not even surface to the user. This is not code that could harm anyone. So to recap, what is the base logic of the linter rule that we are implementing today? We will look at all assignment expressions and then filter explicitly those with an equal and a plus equal sign. Then we will check and filter to only look at those assignment expressions where the left part contain a member expression. And now I'm going to be a bit, you know, uh, inadequate in my terminology. I would say where it ends with outer HTML or in HTML. And then we will do some more advanced analysis for the right hand side. Is it a literal? All right. Is it calling the sanitizer? All right. Is it just a variable? Hmm. Let's try and find out if it's const. And if not, maybe we need to complain. But there are some, some other intricacies I won't go into. <laughs> um, and what if this was already a thing? Well, it turns out we've been using this in Firefox for our front end code for a couple of years now. So there is an ESLint rule called ESLint plugin no unsanitized, and it's doing exactly what I just described. It's free software, it's relatively easy to use if you're already using some sort of linter, it will be much easier in case you already use ESLint. And if you may ask yourself whether it supports TypeScript, as of a, a few weeks ago, it does because a valuable contributor called uh, Luke Wood helped implement those things. Thanks, Luke, by the way. And uh, let's evaluate what does it look like to introduce a linter rule like this into your code base. As I mentioned before, we've been using this in the Firefox browser front end um, because you may or may not know the settings page and various other internal pages in Firefox are implemented just using web technologies. So if you open the settings in Firefox, it's just another tab and the content is really implemented using CSS, HTML, and JavaScript. We've also been using this linter in some other web projects. So we have gained a bit of experience using it. But when we first developed it, we developed it for Firefox to secure our users. And before we embarked on this road, we just thought, do we need this? Is this going to be a lot of work? So we just searched, really naively searched for the term in HTML in our code base. And there was no way we could really say this is or is not an issue with thousands of findings. So we did go through the work and implement a linter rule. And that work really shows valuable in the next number. We could reduce those thousands of findings to 34 linter violations, 34 source lines where the linter says, hmm, something isn't right here. This might be a vulnerability. And we went through all of them. It was a bit of a work. It was a targeted source code audit. Um, and some of the occurrences were actually proper escaped, but not really in the function directly where the inHTML stuff happened, but way, way up in the call chain. Uh, for an example, um, 
even stored in an index DB after sanitization and then read out again. So we, so we completely lost track in static analysis. But that was good, right? We knew which things to look at and which things we didn't want to look at. And we disabled the warning specifically for those code lines where we knew it would be safe. Or we changed them in a way that the linter would easily know they would be safe. And in the end, we only found a handful of vulnerabilities, which it's good we found them, it's bad that we had them, uh, but we could fix them really, really easily, and we did. And again, these are numbers from, from 2017, so I'm not talking about any terrible security vulnerabilities that might harm anyone at all. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's our finding, and that's why I think it can be really useful as a tool. Um, and here's how we integrated this into our code development flow in Firefox. So first of all, we focused on the really, let's say, low-hanging fruit or important items in our list of linter violations. Specifically, we fixed everything we could um, that was looking terrible or problematic or you know, high severity in terms of a security rating um, that we established. And then uh, we prioritized. We didn't fix all of those we designed a path for exceptions. And I think that is really crucial when you're changing the workflow for everyone in your organization, for a big and, um, and old, frankly, it's a really old code base. Um, and I think this is also an important learning for, for us. I'm, I'm working in the security team for us. Um, you need to design a path for exceptions in a process, really in every process, because if you don't, someone else will think of a path for exceptions and they might not tell you about this. So when you're very clear about what you expect people to do and where the exceptions are possible, um, then you will stay in the loop and you will be able uh, to go through all of the violations over time. And eventually we were able to check all commits going into Firefox and we could ensure that new linter violations would never be merged into our code base. So that was the bit about finding DOM-based process scripting. How would you fix this exactly? And I'm not going over you know, actual vulnerabilities and complicated code, but let's think about a um, high-level approach. And for this, I want to present the sanitizer API. The Sanitizer API is joint work with folks in the What WG working group in uh, the W3C at Mozilla and Google. And we're already working on a prototype implementation in Firefox and Chrome. And the Sanitizer API is a proposed API to help clean HTML and protect against cross-site scripting. And for that, we need to look at how you would parse or understand HTML and how you would come to a clean output given some you know, random HTML being fed into a function. Before we do this, a high level overview of the Sanitizer API. First, you have some cross-head scripting vector. This, uh, this number one here is basically the same thing as we had in our intro slide. Then we hope that the developer will be able to sprinkle some sanitizer API magic dust over it, and it will be safe afterwards. I need to say that the sanitizer API is still in early development. We do have a prototype implementation, but we also know that the IP API will change. So I'm not going to bore you with specific code examples that might not work. Also, we really want the sanitizer API to be easy to include in all sorts of scenarios and code bases. We want to make sure that it's useful right in the function where you would do the foo.inHTML equals evil. We also want to make sure that you can use it if you have to store templates or HTML some other place and need to get it back later. And lastly, naturally, we will support customization. So it's not upon us to tell you what safe HTML means in the application. Certainly, we want to allow developers to restrict even more things to make sure that cross-site scripting is not the only thing you can protect against, but also very specific things for, 
let's say, class or ID values that you don't want someone else to control in your code base. And what excites me really about this as a security engineer is that we can rely on some existing primitives in the web platform to make sure this is battle tested and secure. Specifically, we can use the built-in browser HTML parser to make sure that we're always understanding the HTML that is being supplied is understood correctly, which is really important because in the end, we assume that it is attacker controlled. And I think what's really, really the most exciting change in terms of high level perspective is that we want to shift the responsibility for cross-site scripting to the browser. The browser can and most likely will update every four weeks. And if there's a severe security issue, at least we at Mozilla have provided and shown and shown over time that if there's a severe vulnerability in any part of Firefox, we can and will be able to ship an update within the next day, right? So the intention is that once you call the sanitizer API, you're off the hook. As a developer, you did everything you could because we don't want you to write an HTML parser or figure out how to solve all of cross-site scripting. We really want to help. And I think the browser is the right kind of entity in the whole scenario to take the responsibility. Again, here is a code example, but the sanitizer API is still in development. So how it will be invoked is subject to change. But here's how the draft looks at this day, July 16th. 2021. First, you create a sanitizer. And if you don't like the default allow list, you can supply a more minimalistic one. For example, this is for a comment field. And all you want is, you know, some basic text styling and formatting, but not more. Then you supply a list of allowed elements. And then when you have an element foo and you want to set the HTML, you can do so using a new setter that will be parsing the HTML that is being supplied contextually in the scope of the foo element using the rules supplied in the sanitizer. And then the browser will take care of it. And that marks my, the end of my presentation. And I want to highlight that you can fix DOM-based cross-site scripting. You might think this is a big and daunting task, but I implore you, just try it out. Just, if you're using a linter already, it might be easy, just enable this rule and see how much does it matter? How many potential security issues do you have? Maybe this isn't that much, that much of a big deal to you, and then you can stop. But if it does, you can adopt it into your continuous integration flow, and you can do so over time. You can do so gradually, right? You can enable this just for a couple of files or just for a couple of folders. You can also disable it specifically for some files where you know you can do these things. And now you might wonder, can I really, can I really fix DOM-based cross-site scripting? I said, there are some caveats, and it is about the source code you control, right? The, I acknowledge there are some issues with dependencies, but I, I want to encourage you, just take a look, just find it out. And I think eventually you will be able to take greater control of the code that you write and that you author in the scope of your application. Just, you know, just try it out. Thank you very much for coming to my presentation and thanks to Sergi, David and team for inviting me to JS Camp. I wish you a nice day and please feel free to comment in the Q&A section and I will share my slides with you momentarily.